All right, so you should see our big logo, Lewis Clark State College textbook checkout pilot program. Is that what you've seen? That is what I see, yes. All right, okay, so let's go. Um, uh, if I have time, I'm gonna run a little film clip in here. So, and I have until 11.30, including questions, is that correct? Uh, 11.25. 11.25, okay, very good, All right? People need to get to the bathroom, right? Okay. So here we are. Uh, <clears throat> my, I'm Dr. Harold Crook, professor of Nespers language at Lewis Clark State College. And my main gig is teaching Nespers language. Uh, we're, uh, as you know, a kind of a small polytech college. So I have to do some other things. And one of the other classes I teach is world mythologies, English 261. And for a couple of years, I used this, uh, what I will say is an excellent textbook. Uh, Introduction to Mythology by uh, Eva Fury and Margaret Devinney. Uh, wonderful, excellent, comprehensive, very good uh, primary sources. They've got the entire <clears throat> Epic of Gilgamesh. They've got the entire Enuma Elish, um, an abbreviated uh, Ramayana, so, and, and very good essays as well, <clears throat> wide ranging. It does cost $80. So uh, that for our students is... Uh, pretty large expense, uh, but I never did have any terrible trouble with the students uh, rent, uh, either renting it or buying it. But um, I also wanted to have my own approach. So I wanted my students to read the entirety of uh, Homer's Odyssey. I wanted them to do that over the entire semester. Basically there are 24 chapters or books in the Odyssey and um, that's just about enough to have one per class session with a little extra wiggle room on the ends, okay? I wanted them to read a graphic novel translation of Gilgamesh, which is so much fun. Uh, it really brings the epic to life. Uh, <clears throat> I like to go deeper. So I wanted them to read uh, all of Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology. And I wanted to get into some Greek plays and I wanted to get into the Ramayana. But the problem with all that is it's too damn much money. Uh, in fall of 2018, I had a very small class, just seven students. So um, I basically, I just bought them the books and loaned them out. And I got them all back, I think. So um, that was fun, right? Uh, <clears throat> in fall 2018, uh, English 261 was not a gen ed class. But uh, it became a general, general education class uh, during that year. And I was looking at the fall of 2019 of a class of 30. So I was not going to buy them all the books. And I really wanted them to read <clears throat> Emily Wilson's wonderful translation of the Odyssey. She's a professor at Princeton. I may, maybe all of you have heard of her and her translation, but uh, it's terrific. Um, and uh, a really good part about her translation is uh, really deals with the issues of slavery and women on the, in the way she's a faithful translator, but her translation really, really deals with issues of, of slavery and uh, uh, <clears throat> the position of women in the society uh, head on. So I wanted our, our, us to read these. How am I going to do that? <clears throat> I also wanted to, as they said, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology, the Ramayana, the Epic of Gilgamesh. So the Idaho State Board of Education came to the rescue that year. Uh, they had an OER grant and I had been working on uh, OER issues for a couple of years already. Uh, this came in the spring of 2019 and the question arose, what do we do at Lewis Clark State College with these dollars? So Idaho State did something, and Boise State did something, and Idaho did something, and <clears throat> what were we going to do? Uh, well, that previous summer, I had gone to the Open Textbook Network uh, summer camp, or conference, sorry, and I met um, an educator there by the name of Relinda Ruth, and she is in charge of the textbook program at University of Arkansas, Cosatot. It's basically a, it says University of Arkansas, but it's, I think it's basically a two-year college. And uh, she explained that students rent their books from the college for $30 per class. And they require uh, their instructors who are going to do this to choose a text and to keep it for at least three years. So um, 
which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do with professors, but uh, that's what they did. And so students were able to check out $30 per class, their students and <clears throat> their textbooks, and that's the, still the situation at University of Arkansas Cositat. So I proposed to our Dean, Dean Mary Flores, who's now retired, I said, let's, let's try a textbook textbook program, uh, being very self-interested. And I thought, hey, this is a cool idea. Let's try it and see if it will work at Lewis Clark State College. So uh, two of my colleagues and I, <clears throat> I feel the more I talk about this, the more I feel kind of bad that, you know, I, uh, I came up with the idea, I suggested it, and then I benefited from it handsomely. But uh, uh, I guess you would call that a pork project, right? So uh, Dr. Sarah Graham, uh, she teaches Introduction to Humanities 150. Uh, my friend Eric Martin teaches History 101 and 102, um, 101 in the fall and 102 in the spring, and uh, the mythologies book I, uh, text uh, course I just mentioned. So Sarah uses the humanities through the arts, uh, and uh, she's liked it, and she basically got all these textbooks, and we, what we do is we check them out to the students in the fall or at the beginning of the semester, and we check them back in at the end of the semester. And it's important <clears throat> that we do this through the library because that way we can get the books back. If the students don't return them, then they basically have to pay a replacement fee. So um, that helps us a lot with attrition. And the library puts a barcode in there and uh, also catalogs it. And um, basically they are very, very adept at handling inventories of books. And so we uh, have them do this very important professional task for us. Uh, Eric does history, world history one and world history two. So the first section is up to 1400 and then world history two is 1400 and after. Um, so he does two sections per semester. He's got a total of 50 students. Uh, he has 50 books. I looked at the textbook cost. If you got one new, it's $100.20 and rental is 2635, which is not bad. He's using the sixth edition and he's going to need to upgrade the years to the eighth or ninth. <clears throat> and so I'm going to uh, use a different, let's see, I'm gonna use a different, uh, I'm gonna actually let Eric talk in his own words here. I can, uh, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna screen share with Eric here and share sound, okay. All right, so you should be able to see Eric. Who are you? I am Eric Martin, professor of history at Lewis Clark State College. And Eric, uh, what classes are you doing the textbook loaner program with? For history, world history one and world history two. Okay. Uh, would you show us the books you're using? Yeah, it's actually, well, the book I'm officially using. This is the second volume of it. This is okay. what I use for World History 2. And All then right. I use the same book except for it's volume 1 for right. the other portion of the class. And how many students per semester are benefiting from this program? 50 benefit from the program per semester. We've got 50 books 50 in the books. library. Right. And how's the program working for you? It's been great. Um, as far as I know, every student who has wanted to get one of the books from the library has been able to, even though I frequently teach uh, 75 students and there's only 50 books. There's students who want to get their own book because they want to write in it. There's students who want the eBooks. Um, I've never heard from a student that said that they wanted to get one of the free books and were unable to. But most of the time, I, I'm i teaching right at 50 students anyway, so there's no Okay. And uh, you mentioned an issue to me that at some point you're going to need to, you're currently using the sixth edition, is that correct? I currently use the sixth edition. There's a seventh edition out. I'm not sure when the eighth edition is going to come out. Um, because it's history, from edition to edition, I'm not sure how much it really matters to update to every edition, but the further you get between editions, it becomes an issue 
as some of the scholarship is a little bit dated, but in particular, some of the efforts to bring in examples that students would connect with, um, they don't, it doesn't work anymore. Right, so eventually you're gonna have to shift to the eighth edition or something like that. Yeah, the eighth or the ninth. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. see what the eighth edition looks like when it comes out. If you were to estimate, would you think maybe you need to make the shift in two, three, four years roughly, or any idea? Three or four years. Three or four years. And I think I've been doing the program. I think this is the second year. Second year. All right. So you could basically count on getting maybe five years out of a out of an edition, and then be wanting to move up into the next edition. I th I, that sounds about right. Yeah. In I'd like to numbers. see the editions to see the, what changes came about, but right. that seems about right. right. We don't seem to be burning through the books. The attrition rate seems fairly minimal. Hmm. And a really important question, why do you want this book? Ha, I love this book. Tell um, us why. I've been, I've been using this book since it came out with the first edition. There's nothing else like this book on the market. And it is a combination of primary sources, sources from the actual time that you're studying, as well as secondary sources, materials that historians write. So usually with these books, it's a one or the other thing. And this one has them combined and they're combined thematically so that you are comparing the environment of Mesopotamia and Egypt, for example, or you're comparing the social structure of ancient Greece to ancient India. And each of those topics has anywhere from five to eight different documents on it that the students read and then they're able to come up with their own interpretations about what this means so i like that element because i really like uh approaching history from uh the point of inquiry you know asking about historical questions and how do we figure this stuff out and then the other thing i really love about the book is that my main project for the book is there uh, write these mini research papers where they're only allowed to use the material in the book. I'm not sure I see a reason to send them to the library to look for stuff until I see what they can do with stuff that I'm familiar with and it completely um, helps deal with the issue of plagiarism too. Okay, so <clears throat> let me jump back to my PowerPoint here. And there we go. All right, so we've had Eric's perspective. <clears throat> and I, one of the things I'd really like to have you notice is uh, his enthusiasm, right? He's really enthusiastic about this work by uh, Kevin Riley's Worlds of History. Really works for him. Um, Sarah's enthusiastic about the book she's using. And I hope you've noticed my enthusiasm for the books I'm using. So... Um, I'm looking at my set of books uh, and I can keep using these for the next five to seven years until I retire. Uh, I really like them. I uh, want to mention one other area. Uh, we have this crucial par partnership with our library. Uh, they, so it requires cataloging and barcoding. Uh, they must be checked in and checked out and there's currently stored in an empty office. So the operation's a bit temporary, right? Uh, and some general observations. So <clears throat> attrition rate on books is about 5% or less per semester. Uh, students like it, professors like it. Uh, the library is gracious and helpful, but impact is small. Our overall impact on our campus is basically a drop in the bucket, right? Well, maybe not a drop in the bucket, 100, roughly 100 students or less per semester. That's not nothing, uh, but... Um, and with relation to all the classes that are offered and especially in the uh, lower division in general education, it's a pretty small fraction. Uh, currently it's not sustainable, right? So eventually uh, we're gonna burn out through these additions. Um, these are completely free, so unless you don't turn, return them. Um, we don't have a way to expand them except by bringing in outside funding. Uh, the current impact in the library is small. Uh, and so how do we make it sustainable? Well, unfortunately, the only way that I can think of, unless we have a, an endowment, which would be great, uh, <clears throat> some kind of fees. 
right? So you could have $5 per class, which would be really small. Uh, that would just about cover attrition. And uh, if we charge $5 per credit, which would be equal to what we pay uh, for Canvas fees, uh, would allow replacement of stocks and gradual expansion. And I can imagine quicker expansion through uh, fundraising. So you wouldn't do this kind of rinky-dink thing at Boise State or even at uh, University of Idaho, but uh, Lewis Clark State College is small enough that you can imagine uh, finding a donor who would love to buy a set of textbooks for, uh, for a class and uh, we could probably get them to do it. And that might be one way to, since we're a fairly small college, to expand this program. Um, eventually it will impact the library enough that they'll have to get some additional funding for them to fund their personnel and storage. But right now we're nowhere near pushing that. Uh, just our acknowledgements there. And I'm going to drop out of sharing and Let's see here. Oh, no, I don't. Uh, don't that. Let's see, close that. And that's it. So, uh, questions. I've opened my little question thing of a jig. All right. Is anyone still there? Harold, I'm still here. This is Kristen. Oh, good. Good. And, good. <laughs> and I thought that was wonderful. And um, I do have a question, but because of my yeah. status as co-host, I can't type it. So I figured I would just cool. ask it. Um, as a librarian myself, I'm really interested to hear uh, about your collaboration with the library. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they were thrilled. I know as a librarian, it's really hard when students come asking for their textbook and we just can't accommodate them. Right. Um, my question was actually about the sustainability of this project or program. To get that money added to, it sounded like you were going to get it added to the fees that the student pay pays for Canvas. Am I understanding well, that correctly? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what would it, uh, so I haven't proposed this to the provost or anything yet. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, this is, this is just what I'm trying to think. I think this is good. And I think we'd like to have more of it because um, although f any fees at all are sort of, this is not within the spirit of OER. Uh, if we want to expand this, then I don't know how else to do it. So it, we've got to have some money. Um, so what I would, what they do is they add canvas fees at the beginning of the semester to the, um, and, and the students see that right when they enroll. So what I would say is that uh, we would just put it in there. No textbooks are required, but you pay this $5 per credit or $5 total just to keep the thing going. And I have yet to run that by the provost. So we'll see. I know that um, a lot of OER programs, in order to be sustainable, are looking at small fees like that, uh, which is much better than giving the profit to the publisher, right? Or it's, it's more in the spirit of OER than just having the students buy the books themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, looks you like know, you I, do have a question in the chat. I do. I see that. Um, uh, Mary Ongard, thank you for your question. Do you feel like your students are performing better because they have easier access to the textbook? And I will say, yes, I think they do. <clears throat> The most important part is that they actually have the textbooks. So um, if they don't have the textbooks, then they, they fall behind. We know that story it goes like that. Um, I love having all these great books. I love having the, um, the comic book Gilgamesh. I mean, graphic novel, right? But um, for me to tell students you have to buy a graphic novel plus Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology, plus the Ramayana, plus I, I have six books. That's a lot of books to buy for this one gen ed class. So I would, I'd probably not make them do that. So they really love the graphic novel Gilgamesh and it, I just teach with it. It's just great. So um, yeah. Uh, Stephanie Bailey White has asked, interesting, I think more models like this are needed. I don't have any questions other than how can we get more implemented statewide? Yay. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, so we, we have to find some kind of um, way of, of funding it. Um, so, yeah. Hey, 
Harold, as a follow-up to Stephanie's question, mm -hmm. do you feel like getting this funded, the roadblock might be people's concern about new editions coming out and older textbooks that have been invested in are suddenly, uh, you know, no longer worth uh, the investment, that they're, they're not useful anymore? Um, I don't think that's going to be a big issue. Um, I mean, people, people will find all kinds of things to grouse about. So I don't think that will be a big enough of an issue to worry about. I mean, you're like, uh, basically Eric's going to get five or six years out of this set of textbooks. Um, as I said in my uh, slide earlier, uh, I'm 60 and I think I'm going to retire when I'm 66 or 67 or something. But I, I can easily get to the end of my career with this set of books. But, but that's just one person, right? But we've got our, Eric's got more time on the clock. So he's going to need to replace these books. Um, and the, we need a policy that will work for all the classes. So, you know, you could have a class like mine that's basically funding other classes. So I think just put it in a big pot and then see what see where it goes. I, I really like, like this doing pilot projects like this. I think that is really cool. We should do more things like that. But, but one of the things that will happen is, you know, you do a pilot project and then nothing, and then it just dies. Right. It's like grants, right? You get a three-year grant, you do blah, blah, blah. And then after three years, it just goes poof. Uh, whereas what you would really like to do is have something continue after that. Any other questions out there? Oh, Mary Agard. Yes, hi, Mary. Um, LCSC has a bookstore and it's run by Follett's. And they try really hard. I'm actually not against textbooks or publishers. I think, I mean, what I feel is that um, this is all driven by economics, right? <clears throat> oh, Oxford University Press, which produces the uh, Thury and Divini book, um, is nonprofit, but uh, they are. Um, still 80 bucks a pop, pop. And the old ones are just about as good as the, um, you know, the first edition is as good as the fourth edition. I mean, we all know this kind of annoying thing where the, they'll bring out a new edition and they'll add like one chapter or two chapters and it's the new edition. And then you're like, oh, well, please, 80 bucks worth, you know, whatever, right? So, all right, it, I'm down to the, uh, the pips, as they say in England. Um, Mary says, but I asked because we find sharing books sometimes to be in conflict with the library sharing or cooperative sharing with our bookstore. Uh, somehow we're under the radar or maybe, uh, <clears throat> maybe we're, it's okay. I don't know. I have to find out more about that. Thank you, Mary. That's an excellent question. And I believe that's it. It's time to go to the snack table, everyone. Right? Are there snacks provided with this? Oh, it's, it's bring your own snacks. Uh, thank you for both the ideas and the presentation. Um,